morning, church. Morning, morning. Well, yesterday looked like beach umbrella weather, <laughs> but today it looked the same. Hey, if you're visiting with us today, we are really and truly glad to have you here today. We really mean that. I don't know if you're checking us out or if you're just here. We're glad you've chosen to be here at the Fair City Church of Christ today. A couple of men were fishing on a lake. It was kind of an isolated lake. It was big. They <clears throat> got out early. They're by themselves. One guy he throws out his line. He watches the bottom of the water. All of a sudden, to the port side here, boom! He looks over and his partner's got a net and he's just, just raking the fish in. He lights another stick of dynamite and he throws it, boom! <laughs> and his partner starts raking in and he says, what are you doing? He said, I'm fishing. He said, it's illegal. He takes another stick of dynamite, lights it, tosses it to Strin's lap and says, you going to talk or you going to fish? <laughs>
things happen, and this is finally what happens. Peter fell at the feet of Jesus on his knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. Why go away? Peter had been introduced to Jesus. I don't know how Andrew introduced him. He came up and said you could read the account. The idea is, you know, Andrew says, we've seen, we, we found the one that's been talked about, but Peter doesn't seem to be impressed. He goes back to fishing. But now that he's in the boat and he watches the fish, they've fished all night, caught nothing. Now they look at the net, they begin to pull it in, and he begins to see the powerfulness of God at work. And he has to respond to it. We're going to see how different that is a little bit later on. For he and his companions are astonished. This isn't something that happens, has ever happened before, at the fish that they've taken. Peter knows that he's in the presence of God and his life will never be the same. Now, Peter is clueless as to where this life's going to lead. He doesn't know where, he doesn't know how, but he knows right now something has changed his life in a profound way that he will never again be the same. Peter feels sinful, he feels unworthy, he's standing in the presence of of the Lord. I want to take it one. He's standing in the presence of deity. It's the first time it's done. Now. Simon, don't be afraid, Jesus says. From now on, you will catch men. That made me ponder on that statement for a while. Fish. I'm Peter, I know about the fish. Catch you, men. Jesus wasn't there to whack Peter. You know, sometimes in the world, he was Peter. Jesus is this, this person, you know, with a big whip or a big stick, and he's ready to just whack him. That's not his purpose. He wants to challenge Peter, and he wants him to understand, Peter, Peter I want to make you something far grander than you've ever been. You maybe have this idea of having boats and boats of fish, I want to show you something that is more thrilling, more satisfying in your life called catching men. So they pulled the boats up on shore, they left everything, and they followed him. <coughs> Jesus, in so many words, said to Peter, are you going to fish or are you going to talk? Because remember, it's all talk. If we only talk about Jesus, well, I know who he is, whatever. But if I entertain the idea that Jesus is really who he claims to be, the Son of God in the flesh, the Word incarnate, then I'm going to have to consider these words. Am I going to talk or am I going to fish? Challenged by Jesus, they're no longer comfortable. Peter was there cleaning his nets with Jesus. You know, he's cleaning and Jesus is talking and he's cleaning away and he's happy. And Can I get in your boat? Yeah, I'll get in the boat and he rows him out. But after he catches the fish, he's no longer comfortable with Jesus anymore. He's way beyond his comfort zone. They have a choice. They can just keep on talking about Jesus. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, he's a new rabbi in town. What do you think? Oh, he's all right. He's not bad, you know. Or they can understand they're in the presence of God and allow him to change their lives. Falling on their knees, that's what they do. I want to plow this thing just a little deeper. We went through it quickly, and I want to go back three points. I mean, you had three poems and a prayer this morning, all right? We're going to be out here really quick. I want you to notice, as we look at this, there's a new relationship demands on Peter's part a greater commitment. When I talk about Peter and his commitment, I'd like for you to just pretend we're talking about you and me and our commitment, all right? Jesus calls for Peter to launch out in deeper water. And it's really just an analogy of what it is that Jesus wants to do in the life of Peter. Peter's been waiting around with the kiddies in the kiddie pool. He's been ankle deep. Now he wants him to get out of the deep spiritually to where his feet can't touch ground. 
I love living in Hawaii for lots of reasons, but one of them was to go play at the beach, about a block and a half, dive at the beach. It was no fun until you got about here. And it could really move you when seaweed got moving around your feet and you thought it was a shark. Don't think you can walk the water, but you paddle fast. <laughs> it's no fun until you get out. It's not even useful to God until you get out to where you can't touch bottom. Your feet can't touch the bottom anymore. You can't run back to shore. That's where Jesus wants Peter to be. What happened when you were challenged in 2013 to get in deeper water with Jesus? We stood here almost a year ago. We talked about things we needed to do. There were some goals we wanted to meet. Each one of us had our own, some own goals. We had group goals. What happened? What happened in 2014? When we're challenged to get out in the deeper water, and we will be challenged. Maybe you've already been challenged. Maybe it hit you before 2013. Maybe it was 2012. Maybe it was before then. But when you get out in the deeper water where you really find the Christ, I'm going to suggest to you that the first thing will happen to us if we're not really careful is we're going to play by our previous experiences in life. Whatever it is that we did and however we reacted, that's how we're going to tend to react in 2014 unless we get out in the deeper water. Jesus asked Peter, to do something contrary to his expertise in fishing. I believe they would be considered professionals. Peter knows everything there is to know about fishing. He's tried it all night long. This is going to be an important lesson for Peter. One of the most important that he can ever have. Because he's going to learn to not allow what he thought of the past to determine what he's going to do in the future. Have you ever been stuck there? You can shake your head, it's okay. It won't fall off. <laughs> we must not allow the past to lock us in. Does it affect us? Absolutely it affects us. When you failed in the past last year, year before last, when you failed some point in time, last month, last week, two hours ago, are you going to let that be the end for you? Or are you going to try again? It depends on how many times you got slammed to the ground. But if we understand, all right, Lord, I'm out here and I don't have any idea where to go. I was talking to someone yesterday and they said, you know, I have, I have no idea where to go. I don't even know what to pray for. And I said, you know, you're probably right where you need to be. Because then I have to rely on somebody else. I can't sometimes. I'm so glad the text says that the Spirit intervenes on our half with groanings that we can't even wait. didn't have so much luck working in 2013, do not allow what happened in 2013 to lock you into 2014. Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night. We haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I'll add on the nets. <clears throat> worked hard all night, says it all. You ever worked hard, you came home, you said, I'm dog tired. Peter says, Lord, I, I, we've been all night fishing. Haven't caught a thing. We're tired. We need to go to rest. Man, I need some Z's. I need to go home. Circumstances the last night tell Peter, further fishing is useless. You're not catching fish. But it sort of makes sense. I mean, just less than 12 hours ago, he's been out there busting his head on that thing, trying to, trying to get some fish. And Lord said, get out there and can I help? You ever said that? I'm not going to work. In Peter's reply to Jesus, he states exactly the, the current relationship that he has with the Christ. He uses the word master, pistana. 
The Greek word is often translated rabbi. He says to him, really, a rabbi, because you say this. You're a new rabbi in town. You're the newest one that we know of. But you're a rabbi. We're going to, we're going to let that head down because you say so. I think the word master gives us the wrong idea. At least in my mind, until I studied this through this time, because I always think he said master. Master of the universe. Lord of lords. King of kings. But that's not what he's saying. In his first response in verse 5, Go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Peter realizes how empty his life is. Is your life empty? You got a good job, a good marriage, you got kids, whatever your life is going on, but it's empty. Peter realizes he can catch fish, he can do all kinds of things, but he doesn't know the Christ. I don't care how good you are at what you do, if you don't know the Christ. Don't think nothing else matters. I'm convinced that launching out of the deep, if I had to rewrite it right now, I'd write will, produce fear. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't have said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I bet he looks in Peter's eyes and he sees not only sinfulness, but he sees this look of uncertainty on his face that says, I don't even know where to go in the next five minutes. So what would it be in 2014 with you? Don't grab the hymn book. Just to remind you. What are we going to do in 2014? What are we going to do individually? And what are we going to do as a congregation? This new commitment, number two, calls for a deeper relationship with Christ. We see the effect of the new encounter on Peter. Go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Does that sound like a strange thing to ask or request or whatever? I mean, if you take it on service by, you say, Lord, get away. In verse 5, he uses this little word, Itistata, Rabbi. In verse 8, he calls Jesus, he uses a totally different word. He calls him Lord Curious. He doesn't say, go away from me, Rabbi. He says, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. A lot of difference in those two words. And I never bothered to look at it before. First Peter sees him as a Rabbi. The last time he sees him with as Lord, Lord of everything. And he understands. I Those nets were empty last night, but they're full right now. And only the Lord does that. Isaiah saw this. One time he had a similar experience. Isaiah said, in Isaiah 6, 1, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. I suppose he's been in the temple, he's seen it, he knows what it is. He's saying, I see God seated high in this huge temple, and it is, it is filled with the, with the train of God's robe. What's his response? Verse 5, woe to me, I cried, I'm ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord God Almighty. Why is he saying I'm ruined? Because he's seen the King. Never see the King. I talk physically, eye to eye or spiritual. See him by faith. If you ever see him by faith, that will be your response. John had a sermon on Revelation. When I saw him, Jesus, I fell at his feet as dead. Why is dead? Because he's seen the Christ. <clears throat> It'll never be the same. What happens when we really come to know Jesus? We're introduced to his power and his 
His majesty, we're acutely aware of our own sin. Nothing left to do but fall on the knees of your face. Every time in the Bible that some person is introduced to something around God, an angel, an archangel, somebody appears, whammo! Their sin overcomes them and they fall prostrate and they can't even get up. John, in the passage we read, if you went on and read it all, he has to have the angel touch him and give him strength because he can't move a muscle. Peter asked Jesus to leave him, not because he doesn't want to be in his presence, but because he feels unworthy. You ever been there? Anybody? Well, raise your hand. You don't have to raise your hand. I just, you been there? Sure. And when you're there and you don't feel worthy, you just want to push back. You just, but in reality, I want you to understand, it is the knowledge of Jesus and our sin that drives us to his side. It is when I understand my worthlessness, it's when I understand my sinfulness, and I see the risen Christ, the little baby we talked about a few weeks ago that was born into the world to die, and he died for me, and I see that. And that draws me to him because he is the only one that has an answer for me and my sin. So with the one hand, I want to push back. With the other hand, he is purity and sinlessness in his way of dealing with things draws us to him. Remember Peter denied Jesus three times? <laughs> he said, Lord, I won't do it. Man, I'll go down and fight with you the last man. Of course he denied Jesus. He get deep anguish over his now because he Luke says he looked right in the eye and said, Don't move me. Just after he said a few days before, Lord, I'll die with you. Everybody else, all these other scoundrels, they may go, but not me. I'm going to stick with you. Peter went back to his old stomping grounds. I don't know where he got the boat because he left it before, but he gets a boat and he goes out fishing, and the other guys say, Wait a minute. There's 10 more because Judas is dead. There's a lot of that. They're out fishing. another one of those all-nighters they've been to. But they're close enough to the shore that there's someone on the shore that hollers out, Friends, how about you any fish? No answer. He said, Throw your nets on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. Whoa. Andrew, James, and we heard it before? The second time this happens. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of a large number of fish. Peter dashed to Jesus, jumps in the boat, doesn't wait to row to shore. He gets there, his beard's wet, he's a mess. Peter understands he's weak, he's a sinner. But he also knows so much more about this Jesus. <laughs> well, he doesn't know where he's going to end. He doesn't even know that in a few minutes Jesus is going to challenge him, challenge him again by asking, do you love me? But Peter just knows that this Jesus is better than anything he's ever had. Deeper relationship calls for a changed life. A new kind of life. I can't go on with the life I had. That's the one message that screams from all that Peter says. For he and all of his companions were astonished at the test of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on you'll catch men. So they pulled their boats on the shore and they left everything and they followed in. How I ignored everything. Sometimes I think that's what they left. It's all with a lot beneath the boat. I can only find some with boat cloud of fish. The Bible says our nets were ready to break. I get the idea that they got those things to shore, he and his partners, and it says they just left them. Why would you leave the catch of a lifetime? Why would you even think about leaving the catch of a lifetime? You found the grace. Jesus takes Peter a little deeper when he says you'll be catching men, bringing them 
from death to life. You've been catching fish, bringing them flies, killing them. Now you're going to take men from a dead world. You are going to bring them life. This little word catch, we're about through. The word catch says literally to catch a life. It's like you catch an animal, catch an animal somewhere, and you bring them to a zoo. thought I need to interject this, though. Someone has told me that there's two kinds of Christians, those who catch the animals for the zoo and those who come to look at it. Church is not a spectator society in which we go to the zoo to see what's happening. That's what Peter was before he met the Christ. So they got their boats to shore and every indication they left it all. The only one thing move someone like that. Come to know the Christ that fills up a new people waiting in one's life. One translation says they forsook all and fought and the Greek word means to abandon. They just abandoned it. What were you doing in 2014? Going to talk? Going to fish. Jerry, what are you going to do in 2014? Going to talk? Going to fish. Story about a man, I end here. Story about a man in England who, years ago, he was a professor at the university and he needed to go quickly from the university to the train station. So he runs out to the carriage and he hops in and he thinks the man has been given directions where to go and he says, drive fast! The man takes off as fast as that horse will go and all of a sudden he knows enough about there, he knows he's going in the wrong direction. So he says to the man, where are you going? You know where you're going? He says, oh, but I'm going fast. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't do much good to go fast if I don't know where I'm going. I suggest to you that most of our world is in a tailspin today because they don't know about Jesus. If Jesus the Christ is part of your life, you are indeed a blessed individual today. If he's not part of your life, if he's just some <coughs> intellectual thing to give a scent to, just something to mention occasionally, Jesus he isn't standing over you with a stick. The Bible says that will think one he's holding his arms and the other stands at the door and he knocks. He wants you to let him in. And then it forces me. If you're here today and you're not in Christ Jesus, you're not part of the body which he is the head. You're not following the Christ. We baptize you into Christ if that's your desire. You believe that He's the Son of God, repenting of your sins, making a change. We said three weeks ago, don't panic on, don't freak out on the, the change. You want to change. We'll bury you in the water grave of baptism to go through a form of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. You hear your life's not right with Christ, and you need it. There are no people here throwing stones today. We're all sinners at the cross of Jesus. If you need him in any way, let us know what we stand to